And we're back. Mike Cernovich, DangerInPlay.com, Guerrilla Mindset here doing some journalism about genocide in South Africa, what the fake news media isn't going to tell you. So what we're going to have you do is we're going to have a friend introduce himself, and then if you have questions about me or comments, you're welcome to, you're welcome to comment. So as you guys can see right now, we're getting people watching. There's 150 people, 160 people, 170, and then we're going to get all these questions and everything, right? All in real time. So please, sir, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Simon Roach. How do you spell um, that? R O C H E. Okay. Like the medicines. All right. And I'm the um, head of the Office of Coordination of the headquarters of Saitlanders, which is a South African organization constituted under international law, protocols one and two, additional to the Geneva Conventions, a legitimate civil defense organization devoted to the defense of white people in the event of an all-out conflict in South Africa, which is something that we are coming to fear more and more at the moment. Okay, great. So would you spell that organization for people who aren't used to the South African accent? Yes, the word Saitlanders is spelled S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S. And if you'd like to take a look at the website, it's S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S. Org. All right, so a lot of people don't know, and you can kind of fill in the blanks as I prompt you, a lot of people don't know that there is actually a real strong risk of genocide occurring in South Africa, and at one time, an NGO unaffiliated with you or anyone else actually said that on a, on a scale of one to eight, where eight is full-on genocide, South Africa was at a six, or something thereabouts. So could you tell people maybe... Yeah. what this is, the genocide risk, and what it's looking like in South Africa? Yeah, Dr. Gregory Stanton of Genocide Watch, which is, uh, historically speaking, Dr. Gregory Stanton has typically been identified as a liberal. He was a, a strong activist against apartheid, so not a natural ally of ours by any, by any means, came to South Africa to investigate the allegations of genocide, and he has placed us in the third to last phase the, the three final phases end with denial. The uh, penultimate phase is the actual genocide. We are in the final phase, the third to last phase, the final phase before all out genocide. And that's by uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton of Genocide Watch in Washington, DC, the guy who predicted the Rwanda genocide almost to the month, a year before it happened. Now, what is? do you live in South Africa currently? Yes, yes. I'm uh, born and raised South African. I live in Johannesburg. Now, what is your on-the-ground experience or feel or intuition or assessment of current conditions on the Genocide Watch? Well, conditions are severe. Dr. Gregory Stanton made the point that the uh, white people of South Africa were uh, subject to an onslaught um, which he believed was uh, being orchestrated. In other words, the 3,500 odd farm murders and rapes and the 74,000 approximate number of murders of white people over the recent past were not purely coincidental and they weren't purely criminally motivated, that there was some sort of tacit approval or support by powers which he, ne he didn't uh, mention but of course everybody knew that he was referring to the government or the African National Congress. That there was a degree of tolerance and refusal to react through the police and, and legal means, which implied that there was some kind of tacit support and the government was only too happy to see it happening. And anybody who has a query about that is welcome to go onto YouTube and have a look at the videos recording him uh, describing these things. Great, so I'm gonna take a couple steps back because most of the people watching have absolutely no idea what is going on in South Africa because in America our fake news media has completely covered it up and hidden it. So yes. You mentioned farm murders. That isn't something, that is something I know what it means. Andre knows what it means. That is not something most people watching this video are going to have any idea what you're talking about. So perhaps take a step back and describe what a farm murder is. Well, it's an epidemic in South Africa uh, and it refers mostly to white farmers 
who are murdered on their farms by virtue of the fact that the farms are necessarily in remote areas, so there's little chance of help coming quickly. And there have been some terrible murders and rapes that have happened on those farms. I recently read a statistic stating that the likelihood of being murdered as a farmer is greater than the likelihood of dying as a soldier, an American soldier, in Iraq or Afghanistan. I thought that that was ridiculous, it was an exaggeration and somebody had gotten a bit carried away. So I checked the facts for myself with a simple pocket calculator and um, believe it or not, it's true that if you want to live a long and happy life, you should go and fight in a war in Iraq rather than farm peacefully the soil in South Africa. So that's what we mean when we talk about farm murders. Uh, very often it involves the whole family, perhaps the rape of the wife while the husband is obliged to look. There have been one or two incidents where um, uh, husbands have had their uh, eyelids cut so they couldn't squirm their, their eyes away from watching their wives be raped. There is a very, very well-known incident where a young girl of four years old, uh, the daughter of the, of the farmstead as it were, um, was uh, raped by three men and then while she was still alive uh, this four-year-old girl was set alight. So that gives you some indication of what we're talking about when we talk about farm murders. We're talking about spectacularly brutal and vicious events that are happening on a tremendous scale as a proportion of the number of people, the number of farmers. Um, in fact, the statistical likelihood of dying as a farmer, I mentioned the soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan, in South Africa, where we have rampant crime and where police are often shot, very, very often shot, we have terrific police shooting uh, statistics, the chances of being killed as a farmer are double, almost exactly double, the chances of being killed as a policeman. So it's, it's incomprehensible, but it's true. And any viewer of this video can go and have a look for themselves. With 10 minutes or 15 minutes of scratching, they can come across the statistics and the evidence for themselves. Right. It was interesting because I've had people call me a liar because I told them that one family was forced to watch as their son, as a child, four or five, was boiled alive. And they would call me a liar. And I said, no, this is actually happening in South Africa. I don't know that specific incident, but there have been many similar incidents, many, many, many of, of spectacular brutality. I can show you some photographs shortly uh, on my computer, Mike, of uh, people who've had boiling water poured over them, a woman who had a, a, a broomstick forced up her vagina right up to about here, um, some incidents of people having sharpened instruments rammed up their rectums right up their backs. Um, the week before last, a woman on a small holding, what we call a small holding, that is to say a small farm, um, was uh, tied up in a chair and uh, an electric drill uh, was drilled into her joints, her ankle joints and knee joints. Uh, she was, if I'm not mistaken, 68 years old, so absolutely helpless, no threat to anybody, and it was just done by the perpetrators for the sheer joy of it. And, and incidentally, a lot of this sounds to people unbelievable. This is all, you can verify this, they can fact check it, correct? Mm. Yes, of course they can. Uh, there's a terrific website um, called Sensor Bugbear. Sensor Bugbear. It's, written, it's, uh, it's maintained by a woman called Adriana State. And if you Google Sensor Bugbear, you can have a look at some terrific photographs of these murders and rapes. Uh, there are da databases showing hundreds of different people's names and the dates and the times and the places. Uh, another interesting thing, a fact which people can believe or not as they like, but it is a fact, is that in the first 14 days of February this year, more white people were murdered by black people in South Africa than the total number of all murders in the Republic of Ireland over the past 30 years. Wait, hold on. In two weeks, more murders than Ireland in 30 years. Is that right? That's correct. Of, of white population, which is of about 4.8 million people. I don't know the population of Ireland. So uh, as a reference point, people would have to look for themselves. But more people murdered in 14 days in February this year than all of the murders in the Republic of Ireland in the preceding 30 years. These are fantastic statistics. Difficult to believe. But they are true and people can verify them. Now would you 
spell out that website for the people again who aren't Afrikaner? A lot of people would think you have a British accent, but it's an Afrikaner accent. So maybe yeah. spell out that website so people can fact check this if they want to. Yes, it's uh, there's no www. Don't use www. Just put in saitlanders.org and I'll spell it again. S U U for umbrella. So that's S U I D. L A N D E R S dot org dot O R G. Now, would you say that the attacks and the farm murders and the other hate crimes have the approval of the government in South Africa? Yes, for a number of reasons. Uh, let me give you two, and there are more if you like. We can discuss it further. But in 2007, the uh, Minister of Safety and Security in South Africa. Uh, declared in the Parliament that those people who were complaining about the crime, which is to say the, the white-dominated media fundamentally and, and white people broadly, uh, there had been a rash of complaints uh, pre preceding his um, utterances in Parliament, that those people, if they didn't like the crime in South Africa, should leave. In other words, the government wasn't going to take responsibility. The people who didn't enjoy it should go and um, for the past few years uh, the uh, South African Police Service has uh, stopped presenting statistics on the base of race. There was a time when you could access the statistics and say dear me isn't it a bit of a pity that um, uh, so many Lebanese people or so many Zulu people or whatever that uh, people have, have suffered such terrible crimes. Um, uh, but they've stopped doing that specifically so that people don't have a real idea of the severity of these white murders and rapes and what have you on the farms and in the suburbs. And this is not a political thing. It's not a racial thing. Certainly not from my side. This is the government. The government has obfuscated the statistics. So if they believe that it's a racial thing or if they believe it's a politically sensitive thing, well then so be it. But the initiative is from their side to conceal the statistics as, as, um, as we've described. Now, I read an interesting story about a, I don't know if he was what you would call a city council, but he was a white South Africaner who was claimed that none of this was happening. And he was actually murdered in front of his own family in the suburb of Cape Town. Are you familiar with that story? No, I'm not. There's okay. so many, Mike, that it's difficult to keep up with it. And we've experienced quite a bit in, in the USA where knowledgeable people have confronted us with facts and stories with which we're completely unfamiliar. Because there is so much of it, it's just not possible to keep track of it all. Yeah, it's amazing too. And I've talked to people when I visit in South Africa and interviewed people. I was even told that women are instructed to not stop for the police because the police will rape them. Yeah, yeah. There, there is um, a terrible fear amongst people of what they call uh, blue light crimes. Um, blue light, you call it? Blue, blue light crimes. That is to say where a vehicle employs a blue light, a police light. We have blue cylindrical police lamps that the, the police vehicles use to two who commit crimes. It's a, it's a crazy thing. It's huge. Uh, it's been done many, many, many times. So women are obviously um, cautious about stopping for police. They're afraid of it. And we tell our women not to do so, to avoid it as far as possible. You know, if, if you see a blue light flashing, whether it's police or not, there have been some terrible crimes committed by police and with police firearms and police being being tracked uh, by, by the firearms that are used for the crimes. Uh, there have been numerous um, uh, inside, um, uh, how can I put this, sort of in, insider crimes where the police have access to certain information and they exploit that to, to commit crimes. Uh, the stories are legion, Mike. Yeah, I heard a pretty typical, this was such a troubling story to me as an American because it was told so matter of factly. But a friend of mine had to go pick up his girlfriend who was crying by the side of the road. The police had pulled her over and said, you have a scratch on the hood of your car, so we have to bring you into the police station. 
and she knew she was going to be raped at the police station by them. Luckily, uh, an Indian fellow, fortunately, pulled over and said, don't go with him, we're going to stay here. They, they had to intervene. But and this was an official police officer, an official police car. He said, there's a scratch on your car. And she goes, but that isn't against the law. I can have a scratch on the hood of my car. He goes, no, too bad. You have to go to the police station with me alone. And she was horrified and crying. But this happens every day. Well, yes, we have to, as a formal organization constituted under international law, we have to be very careful about what we, about what we say. So I'm always hesitant to agree with an anecdote such as you've given if I'm not personally familiar with it. We're not in a position where we can really afford to be caught out telling lies, for example, or exaggerations or making errors. So I'm not familiar with that incident. But anybody who's willing to do just half an hour's research um, on the internet with some nice Google search terms will come up with dozens upon dozens upon dozens of similar or similarly bizarre stories. There are oh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of like, uh, crazy stories of uh, events involving the police or the government or local officials. Um, too many to even try to keep track of. Now, why is this not a big media story? Because when I talk about South Africa, people constantly call me a liar because, again, the stories, even though they're verifiable, they're not being told by the mainstream media, by The Guardian, The Economist. No one is talking about this. Why is it? Because it would undermine the uh, prevalent discourse of the new South African rainbow nation. It would make all of the media who brainwashed the world for so long that the ANC was benign and that Nelson Mandela, Mandela was a benevolent uncle, it would make them look like absolute fools because the evidence is that everything that they said for 30 or 35 years was wholesale nonsense. It was just absolutely not true. At, at its most fundamental level, it was false. For them now to do a 180 degree turn and to say that South Africa is hopelessly dysfunctional with 3.2 million taxpayers and 16.3 million people on social grants <coughs> with <coughs> something like 40% unemployment in the supposed utopia, for the mainstream media ever to admit, for the mainstream media ever to admit um, that Nelson Mandela was the individual, the particular individual who gave the final approval for the 1982 Church Street bombing. Or that okay, Nelson... so let, let's pause because again, people are so brainwashed that when I tell them about Winnie Mandela necklacing people, they don't even know what necklacing is. So what you're saying, we want you to pause a little bit because you know so much, but you have to realize most people watching have been lied to by the fake news media. So talk about that bombing that was a, a terrorist bombing that Nelson Mandela approved. Yes, in Church Street in Pretoria, uh, when he was jailed, this uh, plan was concocted by the African National Congress's armed wing, uh, known as Nkonto Wesizwe. Nkonto Wesizwe means the spear of the nation. And the plan was concocted and uh, so, uh, approval was sought. And because it was at a sensitive time, the uh, approval that was sought had to go to the highest levels. And Nelson Mandela from jail gave the approval for the Church Street bombing. And remember, he was jailed for treason, not simply on the basis that he was a, a nasty guy, maybe bad breath, maybe, a, you know, whatever, uh, uh, unfriendly guy. He was jailed for treason, having been involved in a plot, in a specific plot. Now, I'm not suggesting for one second, and neither does the Saitlanders, that he was inherently wrong in endeavoring to struggle for his people. That's not the point. The point is simply that people don't know what is the truth. Was he put in jail because he had the wrong color curtains in his house? Was he put in jail because he uh, it was a shoe size too big? What was the reason? There was a reason. The reason was that he was specifically involved in a terrorist plot. As to whether or not it was a good terrorist plot or it was a freedom struggle or whatever you like, is not the point. The point is that people don't know the, the actual truth. So when we talk about the Church Street bombing or 
I'll give you another classic example. After Nelson Mandela's death, two of the most senior politicians in South Africa revealed that he'd remained a member uh, of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party right up until his death, although he'd obfuscated that matter for the benefit of Americans and Europeans and other liberals who just wanted to love him because he had such a beautiful smile. They had mendaciously dissembled around that matter for years and years and years. Nobody would answer the question. Then he would be in church. Then he would be saying, I believe in a higher power. Then he would say that I was baptized an Anglican or something along those lines, as I vaguely recall. Uh, implying always me, a communist to the bone? No, I'm just here to love all of you. And it was a fiction. The, um, a very senior member of the ANC, um, in fact, the most senior member of the ANC in his, um, how can I put this without getting myself into trouble, within his sphere, said, told me in person to my face that Nelson Mandela was concocted by the ANC, that the African National Congress in the 80s realized that it would be a good tactic if they emulated the way that the Irish Republican Army had exploited Bobby Sands as an icon. Bobby Sands starving him to sell himself to death um, in the H block of the Mays prison in Ireland, gained a lot of sympathy from all over the world. And this man told me that we realized that if we could do the same, if we could concoct an icon, if we could come up with something that people would fall in love with, it would be to our advantage. And it worked far more successfully than we ever expected to. Nelson Mandela became a global icon. People knew absolutely nothing about him, but they bought in to him as an icon, and we reap the benefits. So that's a bit of the truth behind, behind it. And if I may, before I uh, 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 stop speaking, Mike, I'd like to touch on what you said about the necklacing. Necklacing was a very common thing. If anybody would like to do the research, they're most welcome. Just Google the search terms. Necklacing was something that was particularly advocated by Winnie Mandela, Nelson Mandela's wife. Necklacing is the killing of opponents in a, in a manner so brutal that it, that it um, intimidates others. The point of necklacing is not to kill. The point of necklacing is to terrify. Necklacing entails putting a car tire around somebody's neck, filling it with petrol or what you would call gasoline, and then igniting it. It's obviously so gruesome and cruel that it terrifies the hell out of anybody who's thinking of being like-minded to that person. And so it was that the, that the African National Congress very successfully terrified black people into, um, into acquiescing, let's say, to the African National Congress agenda. And it was a well-known thing during the struggle, very well-known. People can verify it. They can verify anything that I say in this interview, that the African National Congress intimidated people into participating. If you don't participate, we will petrol bomb your house when we get back tonight. If you don't participate, see what will happen to you tomorrow. If you don't participate, see what we will do to your daughter on her way to school tomorrow. If you don't participate, trust me, your wife won't get to work tomorrow. Now, whether this is politically correct or not is besides the point. Let's say it's the most politically incorrect thing in the world, what I have just said. It doesn't change whether it's a fact or not. It is a fact, and it's not an isolated fact. It's a broad, widespread thing. Tens upon tens, hundreds of thousands of examples of this ex existed or occurred, and they can be verified. But you won't hear this in The Guardian or The Economist or any of these others? No, because it'll make them look like fools. You know, international capital has a big stake in South Africa. Consider for a moment that just, just the province of Gauteng, which is the smallest province in South Africa, not much bigger than Los Angeles and the surrounding areas, um, uh, provides 13% of the entire economy of Africa. Just imagine, one small area provides 13% of the entire economy of 54 countries, including Egypt, Libya, Morocco, the North African countries, and um, a, a billion people. So South Africa is 
from a capital point of view, strategically vital. It's also the southern, the southern sea route. You know, the Cape Sea route is strategically very, very valuable. Should it ever be that the Suez Canal is impassable? Uh, we have the largest um, reserves of gold in the world. If you speak in a regional sense, including countries like Namibia and Botswana and uh, South Africa, the, the threat of instability in that region is uh, too terrifying for words to international capital. So the powers that be that control the media and dictate what the media say don't want to admit that there is a very severe problem in South Africa. It's against their interests. And besides, as I said to you earlier, Mike, it'll make them look like complete idiots because for so many years they told the whole world that the new South Africa was a rainbow nation, a utopia, an example to the world of how successfully people can integrate and live at peace with one another. And there were no faults and no flaws that were ever admitted by them, ever. They never, ever were willing to say, but there's this huge threat, but there's this elephant in the room. But we suspect that the following just doesn't make any sense, perhaps an economic policy or a social policy. The international media kept quiet. If they were now to begin saying, you know, it's a shambles of the first class. It's an it's absolute bedlam in South Africa. 3.2 million people paying tax so that 16.3 million people can be on social grants. A president with five wives and altogether seven, if you include the one who committed suicide, blaming him and the one who divorced him. Um, who admitted to raping a woman, wasn't found guilty of it, but admitted to doing it and then said that he took a shower to ensure that he didn't get AIDS after raping the woman. You know, if they were to start talking in these terms, they would look like complete idiots. So they have to pretend to the world, BBC, foremost, CNN, second in the pack, Sky News, CBS, ABC, NBC, The Economist, The Guardian, The Times of London, uh, The Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, The Washington Post, they all have to pretend that it's not happening. It's the only way that they can save face. Are there hate speech laws in South Africa? Yes, we have amongst the most severe hate speech laws in the world. Um, we certainly don't have the freedom of speech or freedom of expression as we tend to call it in South Africa that you have in the USA, not by any stretch of the imagination. Talk to me more about that. Mike, um, the African National Congress and the Liberals of South Africa will tell you very proudly, as if it makes sense, you know, as if it's a, sort of an intelligent thing to say, that we have the most liberal constitution in the world. And it's a, it's a tyranny of liberalism. If you're not liberal, you're bad. So you are obliged to tow a certain particular line which is far from objective or indifferent. It's, it's not dispassionate. It's very much uh, towing a line of endorsing a particular set of values within the paradigm of the, uh, the new South Africa. So, uh, we are not at liberty to say pejorative, uh, deprecatory things about other people and other races, which is fair enough. Nobody likes to be slandered and nobody likes to be insulted. However, it goes a lot further in terms of what you can hint at. I'll give you an example. A senior economist of the Standard Bank of South Africa, a man by the name of Chris Hart, responded to an incident in about February of last year by saying that this is once again a phenomenon whereby the majority attempts to bully the minority into giving more and more and more and more and more. That was immediately construed as an overtly racist statement. Whereas in fact, as an economist, all he was saying is that this doesn't make arithmetical sense in fiscal or fiduciary terms. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, he wasn't decrying black people. In fact, Chris Hart, many people even in South Africa, if they watch this, don't know, was the head of the St. John's Ambulance Service. So he's a compassionate man, a good man, a kind man, a gentle man. And if you watch any videos featuring Chris Hart, you'll quickly pick up that Chris Hart is a good guy. 
He wasn't putting down black people. He doesn't hate black people. He was merely saying, hey, this doesn't make economic terms. Term. This doesn't make sense in economic terms. There are many more examples. Okay, I have a couple questions. Do you want to take a break for a water yes. or anything? Okay, yeah. take a water break. We'll just Thanks. keep running. All right, so I'm live talking about issues that nobody else in the media has the courage to talk about, the integrity to talk about. They are in town. I, I'm going to talk to Stefan Molyneux. Hopefully we can get them on Stefan Molyneux's show. They're so much. They're such experts, and they know so much that we need to get them a bigger platform. So the um, this video, I want everybody to download it. We're going to keep going. I'm just giving him a water break. No, no, we're going to come on. Real OG hours. Don't think because I'm going to be on 60 Minutes tonight that I care. This is real. This is real journalism. This is real journalism. 60 Minutes, they're going to trash me. Who is fake news? Who is fake news? What is fake news? This is the real news. That's why 60 Minutes is doing a hit piece on me tonight where they're going to slander me and lie about me. But you know what? I'm too busy telling the truth to worry about the haters, to worry about the people who don't want to tell the truth, to worry about the people who want to spread lies. We're saving lives. So this video, I will save it. Upload it to your YouTubes. Upload it to your Twitter. You have... Uh, your Facebook you have a hundred percent right to copyright free you can put it on your own channels monetize it with ads I don't really care this is for you the people to talk about these important issues so I, I definitely we're gonna keep going part two is coming up this is just an intermission so you ready to go sir all right right now part two is gonna come up two things that we're gonna address I'm letting the racist trolls run wild here why People are saying what goes around comes around, and they seem to really enjoy what is happening. It's important for people to know how much actual hatred there is in this world the other way, because we never hear that side. So I'm letting people who say what goes around comes around, I hope this guy is killed. I want them to say this so that people can see, hey, this is the truth, this is the hatred. So we're going to go back to our guest, and I'm going to ask him two questions. So don't talk yet, sir. My first question is going to be, do you fear for your life? And I'm going to turn the camera. Yeah, absolutely I do, and I fear for the welfare of my children. Participating in this is not an easy decision for certain people. For some people who are in particular circles where they are surrounded every day by conservative people, it's a lot safer thing. But for somebody like myself who doesn't necessarily come out of that environment, it's a fearful thing. But I, I must do this because somebody has to do it. And I'm just the guy who has seen the photographs of the little raped girls, little babies raped. Yes, people don't and know this. Ba babies are actually raped, literally raped. Yeah, in farm murders and farm attacks, there are dozens upon dozens of stories of this thing. It's something that you guys are unfamiliar with in America. When it happens in the USA, they make movies about it. They're, you know, films like Seven. And it's an incredible thing that somebody can do so many cruel deeds. But in South Africa, this is a living reality. I'm taking a risk. I'm not enjoying taking the risk, and I might die for what for the risk that I'm taking. I'm certainly going to be pilloried and vilified. That doesn't make me feel warm inside, but somebody has to do it, Mike. And let the people who say that they hope that I'm killed have it on their heads, the rape of those ba babies. Please, God, please put it on their heads, not on the heads of the people who raped those babies, but on the heads of the people watching this video who think that it's fine and dandy to say that the people who talk about it, the people who address this matter, the people who reveal it, deserve to die. Please, God, let it be on their heads. What do you say to the people, and there are hundreds of them in here today, who are saying, what goes around comes around? What goes around comes around if only that was valid. Um, if anybody would like to get into a debate about this, I'm, I'll take the time to, to do it somewhere on a blog. But they should go to the trouble of firstly thinking. Thought has inestimable value. And if you're not familiar with the statistics, you should take pause to think, I don't know what I'm talking about. So let me rather find out the facts and then talk about it. The facts are, it's a well-known thing, that fewer people were killed by apartheid than have died in the past 23 okay. years Hold as on. a result of rampant crime in South Africa. I'm, I'm going to pause you there. Say yes. that one more time. It's a well-known fact. A very well-known fact. And people can look this up. A particular writer by the name of Mike Smith 
Mike Smith has analyzed this matter very extensively. Fewer people were killed by apartheid. I'm not saying that apartheid was a ball of, of laughs. I wouldn't have liked to be in a second class citizen. I wouldn't have liked to have been black under apartheid. Of course not. Nobody's saying that apartheid was grand for all concerned. Of course not. However, if we talk about statistics and facts, the number of people killed by apartheid, apartheid murders, apartheid related murders, is fewer than the number of people that have died in home invasion attacks and murders and rapes in South Africa. I urge people to go and have a look at the pictures of women who've been ostensibly robbed, but in the process of this robbery, because people are poor supposedly, she's had a, a, a broomstick inserted in her vagina right up to her xiphi sternum. Go and have a look. If, if people think I'm telling lies or I'm saying bad things, go and have a look. Pause for thought. Think about it. Ascertain for yourself the facts. The crime is so bad in South Africa that every house I went into had what they called, quokely, a rape door, which is, maybe tell them about that. Well, um, Mike, it's maybe not every house, but, but many, many, um, many homes in South Africa have an opportunity for people to hide, basically, to, to hide behind a door that's maybe not seen or get out of a door. Um, just to just to run away from such an event. Right. So we've talked a lot about the background of South Africa. Mm. Maybe let's talk a little bit more about your organization. What is it? What do you have planned? And give people the website again before you talk and spell out the website. Mm. That way everybody can know again where to find more information. Okay. It's pronounced Sight Lunders, uh, but in uh, English you would probably pronounce it some of the thing like Sewardlanders, and this is how you spell it. S for Sierra, U for Uniform, I for Indigo, D for Delta, L for Lima, A for Alpha, N for November, D for Delta, E for Echo, R for Romeo, S for Sierra, dot org, dot org. Don't use www. Just use the sitelanders.org in your... Uh, so S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S. That's it, dot .org. Right. Now, what is it that you do? We are a civil defense organization uh, constituted under international law. That is to say the protocols additional to the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions were written in or adopted in 1949 and their purpose was to make up for some of the, the, the crimes that were committed in World War II to ensure that in future armed conflicts such particular crimes didn't happen again. <clears throat> in 1977, three protocols were adopted whose purpose was to fill in some of the loopholes that had been uh, discovered within the parameters of the Geneva Conventions over the intervening 28 years. Three protocols. Protocols one and two are relevant to us, and they provide. So I'm going to interrupt you just for a quick second. You are 100% legal. Then this isn't some kind of weird no, no. crypto fascist organization. <laughs> this is a legitimate. No. And and the and the, the vital thing before I answer you properly, uh, Mike, is for people to appreciate that we're not seditionists. That is to say, we don't endeavour to undermine our society. We're not like a communist revolution, um, uh, issuing summis dots, uh, saying that the people, that society is bad or anything like that. We are 100% transparent. Our phones are tapped and our emails are intercepted and we make no effort whatsoever to cover our tracks or to conceal ourselves. We're transparent under international law. Um, we are also not insurrectionist, so we are non-militant. We are not preparing to engage in a conflict. We are an organization in, under international law which provides specifically, we didn't make these laws, the liberal United Nations and the liberal Northern Hemisphere and the West, if you don't mind me saying so, Mike, made these laws. We are just cooperating with them. The laws make specific provision for embattled groups of people, identifiable groups of people, 
to gather together under the aegis of international law and to seek the protection of international law in the event of a conflict in which their welfare is threatened, armed, international and non-international as they put it. So for example, a civil war, international conflicts and non-international conflicts. So we as Saitlanders believe that there's an impending, a looming threat in South Africa. Why do we believe that? Because on the 7th of November last year, a very senior uh, political leader in South Africa said, I am not calling for the slaughter of all whites yet. And as a uh, senior traditional leader, black traditional leader said to me, in your culture, that could mean many things. In my culture, that means only one thing. I wish you to prepare yourself to slaughter these people. This is not a white person saying that blacks are bad or blacks are scary or we should you know, do something about these blacks. This is a black, a senior black traditional leader. Very, very senior. I'm sorely tempted to mention his name and his status. The leader of a complete nation in South Africa saying, when people say things like that in our culture, it specifically means get in the starting blocks because it's going to be ready, steady, go soon. Now, now if that's not enough to terrify us into being prudent, not into being seditionist or insurrectionist, but into being prudent, then I don't know what is. Now, I had a question for you about some images that I'd seen, and I didn't know if these were true or if it was fake, but it was a march with a a doll of a white baby being hung yeah, by a noose, but yeah, did yeah, that yeah. really happen? Yeah, yeah, that really happened. It was during an ANC march, and um, a guy made a little totem pole of white dolls, little dollies, little girls' dollies, um, and pinned them to this totem pole and then as he walked through the gathered people he invited everybody to slap them now if there are still some viewers here who believe that we are racial instigators that we're not being reactive but rather we are being we are instigators then I pose this rhetorical question can you imagine the sheer hysteria that would pervade the world news if a white person had walked through a shopping center with a series of black little girls dollies pinned to a, a plank of wood and invited white people to smash them to pieces. Can you just imagine for yourself, during our recent uh, campaign at the universities, it was a very virulent campaign, uh, there was a sub-theme in this campaign called Fuck All Whites. Now can you imagine? if white people engaged in a university campus campaign saying fuck all blacks a few uh, black students walked around with uh, such t-shirts and what have you can you imagine if white uh, white students at universities walked around with t-shirts saying fuck all blacks this is indicative of the zeitgeist the spirit of the times that is prevalent in south africa at the moment there is a terrific amount of tension and white people are trying desperately not to react. There are precious few incidents that anybody can find in which white people have responded to these tremendous ongoing provocations. People have been cowed by 35 years of Western uh, and Northern Hemisphere um, uh, uh, narrative, liberal narrative about what values we are supposed to hold, what's acceptable for white people to think and to believe, that they're too terrified to react or respond. However, some of us are taking the risk of lawfully, despite the opprobrium, opprobrium that we are going to, or that we do suffer as a result, we are taking the risk of preparing for a cataclysm. If it doesn't happen, so much the better, because then people will be able to laugh at me for the rest of their lives and I'll also be laughing because I'll have lived a peaceful life. However, if it does happen, I will be pleased to say that I was one of the first people who saw the writing on the wall when our state president and other black leaders began to openly talk about whites, whites alone being responsible for all of the problems, I'm quoting verbatim, all of the problems in South African society. 
Great. So we're going to take a break, give you a breather. But before we go, please tell them your name and how they can find out more about you. My name is Simon Roach, and that's spelled like the medicine brand, R-O-C-H-E, Roche, if you prefer, R-O-C-H-E. My email address is hk at saitlanders.co.za. The website address has the suffix .org, as we mentioned earlier, but the email address has the suffix .co.zz, the American letter Z, A, H, K, at saitlanders.co.za. And real quick before we take a five minute break, you are at S-U-I-D-L-A-N-D-E-R-S dot org. That's right. correct. That's the website. Great. Okay, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back so you can go ahead and All right, so, you know, we're doing live filming. Yeah, have your water and chill yes, out, yes, get yes. a coffee, which you want. So, you know, they're doing it uh, Cernovich Media style. They're like, who's this crazy guy who's got a phone? You're going live now. You're not going to ask us questions. And I go, look, I don't edit people. I don't cut people up. I'm here to just say, you tell the people what you have to say live. I don't pre-interview. Did I pre-interview at all? No. No, no pre-interview. No. I didn't tell them what I was going to ask. I just did my research on the issues and they were, you know, they weren't ready for it. So what we got to do is we are going to have a, we're going to do part two. This was part one. Over 10,000 people have watched it already. We're going to spread the word. I'm going to try to get, you know, we got to let Malin you know that this is a very, very, very important guest, very educated knowledgeable this is great things Mike Savage needs to talk about it Hannity Hannity needs to talk about this tell Sean Hannity he needs to talk about this you know how to find Hannity on Twitter tag Hannity in this periscope and say Sean Hannity there's an important issue happening in South Africa this is real journalism tell Tucker Carlson tell these people we need to get the truth out there fake news is not going to tell the truth. Fake news is not going to tell the truth. Let Tucker Carlson know. Let them all know. So I'm going to be right back. We're just giving them a break. They're not really used to, not everybody's used to the Sandwich Media pace. Just frantic. Go, 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 go. So we're all going to rest a little bit. I'm going to be back. Be sure to like and share this video. Spread it around. Put it on your YouTube channels. Mike Sandwich, DangerPlay.com, Gorilla Mindset.